So the end of the year and the holidays are creeping up on us, and as filmmakers, we all share the problem of being impossible to buy presents for. Everything we want is outrageously expensive, and in the end, I pretty much just ask for socks every year. But this time of year doesn't have to be only about buying stuff and Black Friday stampedes. So instead of putting together a list of stuff I want to get, I'm gonna look back on the pieces of gear that genuinely made my life easier as a filmmaker over this last year. Filmmaking is super complicated at the best of times. And when you're shooting, it can feel like there are so many technical things to think about or storytelling moments to remember or people to direct that anything that makes this process noticeably less painful is worth its weight in gold in my opinion. So in this video, I'm gonna go over seven things Things that really honestly helped make my life easier this year, the things that were the most helpful during all the stresses of the job. I'm gonna put them in a rough order of how much I appreciated each one, but to be honest, they all saved me at different times. Though I can pretty safely say that without the last thing on this list, my feature film shoot this summer would not have been possible. So that one is going to keep the top spot for this year. All right, so let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back, and if you're new here, my name is Luke Forsyth, and on this channel, I teach the skills I've learned over 10 years working as a documentary filmmaker and photographer. If you're into that kind of thing, make sure to be grateful to that subscribe button because I've got new videos like it coming out every week. Okay, so the first thing that made my life easier this year is probably something you've heard me talk about on this channel before because you know I have a serious bag fetish and I'm a total fanboy of this company. And that's F-Stop. <laughs> If you're a run and gun filmmaker shooting documentaries like I do, uh, it's all well and good to get the newest and best gear, but first you actually have to get it to your location. Sometimes that's easy and you can just roll a bunch of Pelican cases from the car into an elevator, but for what I do, there are a lot of times when it's not so simple. Like last year, I was the series DP for the spin-off of the survival show Alone called Frozen, and for almost 12 weeks I was living and shooting out of a surveyor's tent in a remote bay in eastern Canada. There were no roads and the only way to get in and out of the camp was by jet boat, and then once the river froze over by helicopter. I had to respond to all sorts of situations from verite shooting to b-roll missions to technical callouts from the cast who needed replacement labs or batteries and so it was really important for me to have bags that could hold a ton of gear but also handle a lot of different environments and be comfortable to carry over tough ground. While shooting alone for example it was normal to have to respond to a call out first by getting into a helicopter then transferring into a boat then jumping into the Atlantic Ocean and then hiking up a rocky mountainside before we rolled a single frame. I'd never really know what I was gonna find when I got there, so I'd have to pack like two to three lenses, extra batteries, audio gear, a drone, extra warm layers, every time, and you need a serious pack to handle that sort of load while still being well balanced. I know there are a lot of brands out there that make rugged packs, and I'm sure they're all great, but I don't think I'm ever gonna have a chance to use them because honestly, once I got my first F-Stop pack, I pretty much just stopped looking for anything else. I normally use this one, which is the 50 liter Tilopa for all my normal shoots, but I also have a massive 80 liter shin bag when I need to haul a ton of gear into a remote spot. And also a much smaller Guru bag when I just need to carry like a YouTube setup. They feel indestructible, uh, they're incredibly weather resistant, and they feel like a hiking bag on your back. Even the mountain guide dudes helping with safety on a loan comp complimented them, and honestly those guys normally spend their time making fun of the camera operators stumbling around in the woods. The Tilopa is probably the perfect all-round camera back out there, and the new Dura Diamond fabric, which is the newer version of this one, in green, looks so good in my opinion. I'm gonna link to all of them in the description, but if you pick one of these up, I promise you're gonna get years of use and abuse out of it. All right. Moving on, the next tool that made the year easier actually pulled off what I thought was impossible, and that's that they made me hate using GoPros just a little bit less. Yes! Come on! Coming from a photography and cinematography background, I've always had a love-hate relationship with GoPros that trends pretty hard towards the hate side. Sure, they're really useful for getting cameras into tight spots, and there's more than a few times in my career where getting the shot would have been impossible without them. They're great at what they do, but they have one main problem for me, and that's that the footage looks terrible. At least it looks terrible most of the time. When I think of GoPro footage, I think of wide angle, high frame rate, unnaturally smooth footage that you can always tell came from a GoPro. You can mitigate some of this by using the linear lens and shooting on the flat profile at a fixed white balance, but it's really the fact that you have to use the auto shutter to get the right exposure 
exposure that's the worst offender for me. I don't want to get into a full technical breakdown of how shutter speeds work, but footage shot at the wrong shutter speed, like when you're shooting 24 frames a second and the shutter speed is set to something higher than double the frame rate, just doesn't look cinematic to me. And if you lower the shutter speed on a GoPro to let's say a 50th of a second, most likely your shot's gonna be overexposed. With most cameras, the answer to this problem is just to use ND filters to bring the exposure down, but for some reason, I never really thought that was an option with GoPros, so I just avoided using them. Then this summer, I realized there were some shots that I needed that wouldn't work without a GoPro, so I started looking around for solutions, and I found these guys uh, from a company called Freewell. Now maybe for some of you this isn't revolutionary news, but for me, I guess I just never thought to look for a product like this and accepted that GoPros had to look bad. But now that I have these, I can just drop the shutter speed to match the frame rate and suddenly my GoPro footage doesn't look all that bad. I mean, I'm still a cinematography snob and I'll do anything I can to use a real camera whenever possible, but for those times when nothing but a GoPro will work, it looks way better when you shoot at the right shutter speed instead of just on auto, which is only possible when you use these. And that definitely makes my life easier. All right, moving on. Like I said, the last couple of years I've been working on the show alone, and that means keeping a ton of different gear running in remote locations. We also needed a lot of drone shots, and even though I have four extra batteries for my drone, with the strong winds and the quantity of footage I was shooting every day, I was always running low. There were even a couple of times when I had to choose not to get certain shots because I was worried I'd run out of battery for later in the day, and that's really just not a situation I want to be in while shooting. Enter this guy. My new best friend on travel shoots. This is the Omni Charge Ultimate Plus, and it's pretty much helped me avoid situations like this ever since I got it. Portable batteries aren't anything new, but the problem with most of them is that they're usually designed to charge something small like a phone a few times, and they don't have that much capacity or else they don't have enough output to power professional accessories like the batteries for my camera or my drone. I've carried around huge batteries before, like this one from Goal Zero, and it's great if you have a car nearby, but if you need to carry them for any length of time, uh, your arm's probably gonna fall off before too long. This OmniCharge is the perfect middle ground. It's high enough capacity to charge a laptop twice or up to like four drone batteries, and I'm pretty sure I've done eight of my FX3 batteries on a single charge before. It's got the usual USB-A and C port um, but it's also got an AC plug, which means I can pretty much power any piece of gear I have, unlike those smaller banks that only have USB. Now it's not tiny, but it's also small enough that I can put it in a backpack and it makes it way more useful than the Goal Zero. It's built like a tank and has uh, this rubber shell on it, so I don't feel like I have to baby in the field. They make a few different sizes of these things and I'll link to them in the description if you wanna look at the different options, but I like this one, the Ultimate Plus, for most shoots just because of the super high capacity. It's not a crazy technological breakthrough or anything, but it's just a well-designed product that seems like it was made with filmmakers in mind, and it definitely made my life easier this year. All right, so breaking away from field gear for a second, the fourth thing on this list is more of a post-production tool, but it has absolutely made my life easier when it comes to one of the hardest parts of editing my projects, and that's finding the right music. There's a ton of services out there that you've all probably heard of that sell royalty-free music subscriptions, and I've used most of the major ones. But this year, Audio, and that's audio spelled with two eyes, reached out and became a sponsor of this channel, and it's made my life so much simpler and easier by shifting the focus away from quantity and towards quality instead. I remember logging on to some of those other music platforms and just feeling lost when I'd see these massive lists of songs to look through, but Audio does it a little differently by spending a ton of effort on curating their library. I mean, they still have tons of stuff on there. I think it's like 6,000 and tracks or something, but because of how tight they keep the collection, there's no throwaway junk on there. It's all hand-picked good stuff. For me, that is way more important than just numbers because the last thing I want is to spend hours scrolling through lists of songs I'll never use when all I really want to do is find something that works and start editing. There's also a massive sound effects library there, which I love for sound design, and those are also really high quality as well. Now, Audio is a sponsor of this channel, so do with that information what you will, but I'm under no obligation to actually use it if I thought there was something better out there. The thing is that since I started working with audio, I've actually never needed to use anything else, and I honestly haven't used any of the other services, even though I'm paying for some of them. And saving maybe the best for last is the price. Audio is hands down the best deal out there, especially if you're just starting out in your filmmaking career. Right now, viewers of this channel can save 70% on the pro plan, which brings the yearly price down to $59, which is insane if you've ever shopped around for music services like this before. Just follow the link in the description and use the promo code LUKE70 to claim the discount, but I'd say you'd probably 
probably want to jump on that quickly as you can because let's be honest, there's just no way that they can stay in business and keep prices that low for long. So at some point, I'm guessing they're going to have to jack it back up to somewhere closer to market rates. It's a really great service for an amazing price run by a nice group of people and it seriously made that part of my life as a filmmaker much easier. So check it out before it's too late. Okay, so next up is something that I've been raving about on this channel since day one, but the difference that this thing has made in my filmmaking process is crazy. And that's my tripod, the Sackler Flowtech. I'm actually using it right now to film this video, so I can't actually hold it up, but it's working hard for me as always. Coming from a photojournalism background, when I first got into filmmaking, I didn't really think about tripods as that important. All my work was handheld and I liked to travel as light as possible, so I got the smallest, cheapest tripod I could and threw it in my bag, almost like an afterthought. But very quickly, once I started taking filmmaking seriously, I realized how important tripods were and how much of a difference there was between a good one and a bad one. A bad tripod is awkward to set up, it's hard to level, it doesn't have the right head to make smooth pan and tilt moves, and it's really hard to adjust, which pretty accurately describes that photo tripod I tried to put to work in video. It took me eight years to upgrade that thing to the Flowtech, but the difference is insane. And even compared to high-end video tripods that cost two to three times more, I'd still pick the Flowtech pretty much every single time. Unlike most tripods where you have to adjust all the different stages individually, which is really annoying when there's a loaded camera on the head, the Flo Flowtech is controlled entirely from one set of latches right at the top. So going from super low to super high takes about two seconds instead of 30. It's easy to level, the strength to weight ratio is nuts. I mean, it weighs less than 10 pounds with the head, but it can easily hold my fully rigged out FX9. And it's so strong that it took multiple direct hits from an assault rifle and still worked like new. When I was shooting on alone, most of the other camera people were using much bigger, heavier tripods and had a really hard time getting them into remote spots. With the Flowtech, I could just strap it to the side of my backpack and hike in, and that made a huge difference in the kinds of shots I was able to get. The major downside to this thing is the price, because once you add on a decent head, it's going to be expensive. I think for the legs on their own, they cost around $3,000 these days, but since we're talking about things that made my life easier and not cheap things, the Flowtech goes right near the top of this list. I tend to shoot most of my scenes handheld or off the shoulder, but it's still amazing how often I switch the sticks. From interviews to establishers to long lens stuff, even my handheld shoots are probably at least 20% shot on a tripod. So having one that's pretty much indestructible, that's light enough to strap to my backpack, and and that's burly enough to hold my heaviest camera setup is one of the biggest quality of life improvers out there. Tripods also don't go obsolete really, so get a good one early on and you'll have it forever. I'm on year five with mine now, and if I lost it tomorrow, I'd replace it with the same thing as much as the price tag kills me. All right, from the biggest thing on this list to one of the smallest, the last piece of gear that made my life easier this year is all about audio. And that's this guy, the Tentacle Track E Lav Recorder. I say it all the time, but audio is the backbone of your documentary story, not video. And having characters mic'd up is mandatory for documentary filmmaking, in my opinion. Now the top mic is decent for getting ambient sound, but documentaries are about people. And the second the people you're filming turn their back to you or get in a car or walk into the next room, your audio is ruined. And trust me, as soon as you get into the edit, you'll realize what a disaster that is. For most shoots, the answer is a wireless lav system, something like the Sennheiser ENG3s. You put them on your characters, it sends audio, back to a receiver, which then sends the audio into the camera. I've used a system like that myself since day one of my career, and it's great until it isn't. Most cameras only have two audio ports, and since one is taken up by the shotgun, you're only gonna be able to use one lav at a time without some sort of external recorder. But external recorders for me are just more things to monitor and go wrong, and I've never liked them personally. So what are you supposed to do when you don't have a sound person with you and you need to have more than one character mic'd at a time? Or what happens if you're filming people from a distance and the wireless system doesn't reach, which happened to me while filming rock climbers for Red Bull in Northern Mexico last year? Or maybe you're in a location with a lot of radio interference, which ruined my audio for weeks during my feature film shoot this summer and is the whole reason I started using the trackies in the first place. These things are pretty much the same as the Sennheiser system and you just plug in a mic on the top and then put them on your characters like you would with a normal lav, but with one important difference. These record everything internally to an SD card, so instead of transmitting them back to your camera, it's all being done inside. That means it will roll audio from any distance in any condition, and you can put them on as many people as you want. I used four of them this summer, and without a sound recordist, there is no way I could have mic'd up that many characters on my own. They also have a 32-bit flow track, which means basically they won't clip even when you're not monitoring them, which is also huge for small teams. 
teams. Now this technology isn't new and there's been things like this on the market for years. The company Zaxcom made the first ones that were really popular and since then other companies have made their own versions. Some are way more expensive and some are way cheaper than the tentacles, but the main reason I chose these ones are because they work so well with tentacles own timecode boxes so that it's easy to sync all these audio sources together. If you're lost here, I'll link to a detailed video explaining timecode in the description, but basically it's just a tiny box that controls the clock in your camera and then matches that time to all the other cameras and mic packs you're using so that in post they can be perfectly synced up for editing. Tentacle's timecode system is really easy to use for small teams and because they also make the track ease, the whole thing works together extremely well through one app. And for me, the whole system fits into the kind of price point that gets you professional quality stuff without buying crazy expensive gear that a pro sound guy would have. One of these is I think $3.99, which is about the quarter of the cost of the high-end stuff from Electrosonics, so even though it's not cheap, it's honestly a really good deal for what it is. Now they're not made of solid steel like a set of Electrosonics, but they're still really well built and I feel good using them anywhere. Okay, this video is already getting too long, so I'm gonna wrap it up here, but let me just finish with track ease by saying this. Story is king and audio is the spine of your story. If you're anything like me and you think you might find yourself needing to get clean audio on multiple characters without the help of a sound recordist, the Trackies are the best solution that I've found that doesn't cost the same as a small car. Now that I've found this system, I'm amazed I was able to make it work for so long without them. They've been such a game changer for me this year, and that's why they're getting the top spot on this list. So that's it, the top gear that made my life easier this year. Gear is part of filmmaking, and investing in the right stuff can make a big difference in how smoothly your shoot goes, and how sane you are at the end of it. I love hearing about the this stuff though, so if there's anything you found this year that's made your life easier that I didn't mention, let me know what it was in the comments. Hope that video was helpful, and if it was, please do me a favor and do the whole like and subscribe thing so I can keep putting videos out like this one. And if you did like this one and you're a gear nerd like me, maybe check out this other video I made about different kinds of grip gear I use on travel shoots. See ya!